Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Faster Masters Rowing Radio for November 2019. I'm Rebecca Caro, and I'm here with my co-host. Hi, Rebecca. That's Marlene. Now, before we kick off into the content, we just need to mention the supporters and sponsors who help us to bring Rowing Chat, all the Rowing Chat podcasts for you. Back in the boat means blisters. Fall rowing means many of us are back in the boat after taking a break from the summer racing season. And that means sometimes we get blisters in our hands. Rowing Chat has written an article with a roundup of the best rowing gloves and also specialist hand creams designed for water environments. You can find the full list at rowing.chat forward slash sponsor forward slash rowing hyphen gloves. And that link is in our show notes. And by clicking through on any of the links in these articles, you support us because we have some affiliate relationships with these vendors. So it really helps us. Our second sponsor this month is Rowing Related. Good independent journalism is a valuable commodity nowadays and rowing newspapers are no exception. Brian Kitch writes at rowingrelated.com and his detailed knowledge of the sport has built its reputation as an excellent source of information, news and opinion. You can get yourself a subscription to the monthly newsletter with a 20% discount for your first year for this exclusive offer just for Rowing Chat listeners. Read his free introductory article, The Future of Rowing at the Olympics, How Rowing Should Adapt to Stay Relevant and Grow Its Base on the World's Grandest Stage. You can find this on the homepage at rowingrelated.com. Subscribe to get the discount at rowingrelated.substack.com forward slash rowing chat. And again, that link is in our show notes. Now today, Marlene, let's run through what's coming up in the November program for the subscribers to the Faster Masters subscription service. Okay, the, the November Faster Masters rowing program, which will be live on the 1st of November, includes, we have one rowing and land training program for those with their peak head race this month. We still have some people racing in November and that it has their taper as well as the uh, training leading up to their taper. And we also have a second rowing and land training program for those who have now completed their fall racing and who are uh, transitioning into winter training. Our technique focus this month is on power drills. The performance module features our articles about the future of rowing data and the elements of endurance, factors affecting endurance training. This is part one of um, an article that has two parts to it. In our rowing lifestyle module, we talk about thoracic outlet syndrome, which is a common nerve compression injury of the neck, um, which affects many rowers. And we tell you how to take preventative or corrective measures for that. And it reinforces again, why posture is so important in rowing. Um, every month we have a bonus gift. And uh, we're not going to tell you what this is because we'd like to surprise you, okay? <laughs> so that's what's coming up. And uh, for our su subscribers, everything will be live on the 1st of November. November. Fantastic. Thank you for that summary. Now, for our podcast this month, we decided it would be nice to do some questions and answers for people who are interested in Masters Rowing. And um, we've got seven separate questions that should come in from our listeners. So firstly, thanks to all of them for their enthusiasm. And secondly, we do have a few more questions that have already been asked. And if you have a question you'd like to add in, we will do another program later on answering some of them. Our first question came in from Emily Erbelding, and she says, can you discuss the taper period in intensity of training leading up to a big race, whether it differs for a sprint versus head racing? 
and what the individual characteristics might lead to a longer or a shorter taper period being optimal. She says, I consistently feel as though the lead in period to racing has too little intensity for me. And I'm interested in knowing the science behind the taper. This is a good question. Um, taper, obviously taper periods, the purpose of the taper is recovery so that when, when you reach the starting line on race day, your body is 100% recovered and you are 100% ready, ready to race. And um, a taper period, the, the length that you need, whether it's seven days or 10 days or 14 days, really depends on your tra your training load. The higher your training load has been, for example, the number of sessions you do per week, the longer taper period you require because it takes 10 to 14 days for your muscles to recover all their muscle glycogen. So on a day-to-day -day level, when you train, you're constantly using your muscle glycogen. It gets depleted. It recovers to a certain degree. But if you've had a long period of training and really um, good quality preparation, your glycogen levels are never up to 100%. So the purpose of the taper period is to allow that recovery of your muscle glycogen. And it's also to allow your nervous system some recovery, which is often why we start to reduce strength training significantly. And you don't change the number of sessions you do per week, but you do decrease the amount of work that you do over, over a period of a couple of weeks. And Emily brings up this point of, um, she consistently feels as though the lead-in period has too little intensity. Well, uh, there are two types of people out there. There are people who love the taper and there are people who hate the taper. And you're usually nowhere in between, okay? The people who like to work, 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 work really hard all the time, don't like the fact that they have to back off and they feel like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? I'm, I'm decreasing my training. I'm not going to be ready to race. And it's, it's, a, it's a little bit stressful for them. Then they're the other half who are like, oh, I love this. I don't have to do two pieces today. I don't have to do four. This is wonderful. I can rest a little bit more. I'm not so tired. So there, there are two types of people who like the taper. Um, it is a very, very important period of recovery and it it doesn't differ in principle from sprint training to head race training it differs in what your actual sessions are on the water because your 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 racing your race pace is different your strategy is different but the principles of how you actually taper are the same regardless of what type of event um, it is Brilliant. And now we have an associated question, which came in from Sebastian Kazmiersak. He says, some coaches believe tapering at the master's level doesn't require more than a day or two, while others prescribe a weekly program. What physiological signs can we look for as athletes to ensure we have an optimal taper? Also very good question. And uh, Sebastian is a very competitive master's rower in the United States. Um, I absolutely believe that master's athlete need tapers, um, maybe even more so than everybody else because master's athletes are, um, have a family life, they have full-time jobs, they're traveling, they're managing a lot of things besides their training and the travel to training and et cetera. So, um, Definitely master's athlete need taper because the purpose is the same, to be ready 100% um, when, you, when you get to the starting line. And what physiological signs can we look for as athletes? Uh, you feel rested. You, you feel super motivated. Um, I, I like to taper my athletes to the point that they're, I, I call it, they're just itching to start the race. They're just chomping at the bit. I want you to be chomping at the bit when you're going to the starting line. Like you're, you're just, you're ready to blast out of there. That's when you've hit your taper um, properly because you've got to be fully charged. You don't want to be dragging your butt up to the start line and saying, oh, you know, I need half the race to get warmed up. You want to be so psyched up, you're ready to go. So 
that's going to be your muscles feel great. You don't have any muscle soreness. Your glycogen is recovered. Psychologically, you're excited. You're motivated. Um, it's all win, win, win. It's all positive. You know, if you've got yeah. lots of negative things creeping into your mind and you feel you, you feel like a piece of crap, um, you you probably haven't done your taper very well. So um, optimum taper, you feel great. You're ready to go. And you're ready to race the race, not just survive the race. Yeah, I also agree that some people will feel pre-race nerves. So you might think you feel crap, but actually recognize the difference between feeling not ready to race and feeling nervous of the upcoming challenge. And those should be quite different feelings. When you've done a few races, you'll work out the difference. Yes. It's like adrenaline is your friend. You know, your adrenaline is telling you, you know, you're, you're getting ready to do something, you know, it's, it's, it's revving you up. It's a, you can turn that into a positive versus a, versus a, a negative. So I hope that's helpful for Sebastian and for Emily. Yeah. They're both I'm very Oh, go ahead. Sorry. One tiny little thing. I am in the habit of weighing myself every morning. So I know what I weigh. And I know when my, for me personally, my physiological signs of tapering is that I start to lose weight. So what that tells me is that my body is con continuing to, you know, fire well, to consume energy well, and to output energy well. And by and doing less work, curiously, means that I generally drop, you know, maybe a pound before race day. So half mm -hmm. a kilo sometimes it's, it's variable, but it's, it's definitely curious for me that I feel like I taper my training and for some reason I lose weight. And I, yeah. that's that for me part of tapering. Yeah. Well, it's that, it's that little, it's that sharpening, of, that's that sharpening effect, you know, that your, your body is primed primed for the race. You know, um, if you're going into a major race tired and, and, you know, it, and it's, it's normal that people, some people are afraid, they're afraid of the type, the taper because they're afraid, oh my gosh, I'm not working so hard every day. And, you know, you work hard in your short pieces. You're, you're still doing your race pace or whatever you need to do, but you're just doing less of it. It doesn't mean that it's less intense. Um, and, um, you just, you have to trust your training. And hopefully you have a good coach who knows how to who knows how to nail your taper because yeah. that is a, that is definitely um, an art and a skill and takes a little pixie dust I call it. <laughs> so okay, now this I'm going to give read this question for Rebecca. Okay, this this question comes from Jeff Murray. He says, "Hi Marlene and Rebecca, thanks for the opportunity to ask a question." What's the fastest way to negotiate a narrow, hard, 90-degree turn in a quad during a head race? And Jeff gives us a little, a little background. He says, I'm, I'm with the Dallas Rowing Club. We just competed in the head of the Colorado in Austin, Texas. And the course featured a sharp or what felt like a sharp turn in a quad to starboard. Our current tactic is to maintain speed until about 50 meters before the turn, check starboard hard, basically sliding to a stop into the turn. We then back and row until we were on point and then do a sprint race start to get going again. We tried this the first time at the head of the Colorado and it was a mess. I was in bow and didn't control the backing and rowing very well because I was looking for the point. I misjudged the point, which was along a line of buoys. Uh, we albeit briefly rowed off course and were penalized, negating any benefit to our crafty maneuver. <laughs> <laughs> this just seemed way too complicated with too much margin for error. We didn't get a chance to practice this much. And with the limited time we have until we do it, until we need to do it again, I would love your guidance. Thanks for all you do for this great sport of ours. So Rebecca, I know like you love steering quads. So what would you, what would you advise Jeff? <laughs> so Jeff, number one, your biggest mistake was not having practiced this enough. There is probably nothing wrong with the maneuver that you describe. I just know that under pressure in race conditions, you all revert to the norm. And for example, if one person in the crew is anxious about having to do this steering maneuver, they might start trying to do it before everyone else. You know, if your calls were not absolutely precise, if everyone didn't 
check in exactly the same way. So firstly, practice it. Practice it every time you're in the boat, you know, maybe three times if you can. Having said that, I, of course, as Marlene says, have my own ideas about steering tight turns. My first thing is to suggest that you should steer before the turn. So imagine you're approaching a marker, whether it's a bend in the river or a buoy or a buoy um, or a post. Try to come into it a little wide so that you reduce the angle of turn. You mentioned 90 degrees. If you can come in wide and reduce that to a 70 degree angle, then the amount of tight turning is, is reduced and you can do it faster. So that's the first point is steer before the turn. The second thing, if you feel able to do this, is to adjust your steering wires. So if you know all your turns are in the same direction, adjust the foot um, steer point on the wire so that it gives you more leverage in one direction than the other. Now, this does require you to adjust where your foot naturally sits when you're not steering, and you may not want to do that, but I would say that that is worth considering. The third thing is something that I learned from a little bit of ocean racing that I have done in the past, and this is about uh, you describe how you check first on one side to bring the boat to a stop, then row on with yours on the other side to make the turn. When doing the checking maneuver, there are a couple of different ways of doing this. Most people, when asked to check the boat, try to square their oar. This is a mistake because the oar doesn't sit square in the water because the water is flowing past the boat. You're moving fast at this stage. The way to stop your boat very quickly is to put a feathered oar under the water surface. So lift up your hand on that side with the oar feathered. And trust me, the boat slews around a lot faster than it does if you try and square the oar. Once the boat slowed a little, you can then square the oar quite su successfully. And of course, that puts a, an immediate handbrake on. When you're doing the turn, there are a couple of different ways of doing it. Um, I would suggest that it's worthwhile rolling right out to the catch with the oar that's got to make the, the power turn, the rowing on, and to do legs only rowing. So to roll right forwards, reaching your arm as far sideways out of the boat as you dare, so that you have a really acute angle of attack with your oar, and take your strokes from there, but go from there to maybe just to leg straight or even just to half slide. So you can take these strokes really fast and square blade. So there's no feathering. Everything is just bang, 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 no ratio at all. So you're taking super short strokes with a really sharp attack angle. And that is more likely to bring your boat around, the bows around really fast. So that's my summary of how you might practice going around your boy really super fast. Definitely. And here's now this, here's another question also about turning. Um, this is from Tom Erickson, age 65, master's rower who started rowing at age 61. <coughs> and he says, hi, Marlene, is there a preferred technique for a fast stake turn? I did the Green Mountain Head in beautiful Putney, Vermont at the end of September. You are probably familiar with this race but the course is about one and a half miles upstream, a stake turn and one and a half miles downstream to the finish. I was happy with my performance for the race, but I probably lost 10 to 15 seconds doing the stake turn poorly. And actually this was my very first signals race that I rode in 1986. Um, so Rebecca, what would you say? The same tactic here for making this turn now in the, Putney, you've got to turn two buoys that are at 90 degrees. So this is a triangular race course, effectively. Well, um, it's actually more like a oblong. Like you race okay. down, you turn one buoy. You you probably have to row five or six strokes, and then you have to turn another buoy. Oh, so okay. there there is two buoys to turn in close succession. And we're going to assume then that Tom is racing this in a single, so yes, somewhat yes. different from a quad. Yeah, this is so, mostly singles. I would say some of the same. Um, 
things apply in a mass race. And I learned a little bit of this when I did a summer's uh, ocean swimming uh, with my friend Carol. I learned a lot about how to sharpen your elbow. So when you have a bunch of swimmers all doing pretty much what you just described, you have to go around a boy, um, swim a little bit more, go around another boy. Um, you have to decide as you are approaching it, are you on your own? Are you the only boat that's anywhere near the boy? Or are there other boats in close proximity? Because you may decide to go wide around the buoy in order to avoid hitting someone. So I think there are some in the moment decisions that you will be making. But in a single, you can turn much, much tighter than a boat like a quad. So in the same way that um, I made the suggestions for the quads uh, for Jeff, do do the stop the boat using a feather door under the water and as you slow your boat down i would suggest squaring your blade and counter feathering it so that it's like angled under the water this will really really dig that rigger down toward the water so it feels a little scary because you think oh my goodness i might be going to flip but you aren't trust me um so that you can really, if you tilt the boat, it's a bit like a bicycle or a car leaning into a bend. So be very aggressive and try and get your oar square and then over squared on that side. And then if you can hold that balance in that hand that's on the, on the checking side and still do the same maneuver, reaching right out to the catch and taking these super short square blade strokes, you can turn a single really fast. Now, I learned this technique from a gentleman called David who uh, rode in San Francisco Bay out of um, the open water sculling center. And he was new to rowing, but he brought a lot of um, sailing expertise into the sport. And he taught this to me and a lady called Orlando Lopez, who I got to row with a few times. Hi, Orlando, if you're still out there. Oh, I've um, met Orlando, um, I've worked with her. Yeah. Um, and it was really interesting for me to see actually how steep you can tilt the boat in one direction without it flipping. So, again, I would say go for it, Tom. <laughs> practice this one first. Definitely practice. That actually sounds like a lot of fun to practice. Do it. If you can get a hold of a learner boat to practice in, they're a little bit more stable. Um, but it it is. Um, it is you, you can you can like just practice this every time you stop and turn your boat around. Sure, absolutely. You know, just this practice it, call it right. We're going to stop and we're going to do a, a total turn. And obviously, in that case, you're probably turning 180, not 90 degrees, but it's still good practice on the next one. Check it now. Check hard and then say and row on now. And then just you just have to judge the second now for people then to have time to roll forward up to the catch to start the row around. And depending on how well your boat steers, if you have steering wires, I have definitely rowed in some boats that like have a very tight turning circle. For some reason, the proportion of the fin to the rudder is such that it, it has a very tight turning circle. If it does, I would be inclined to, to be stationary for less time and trust that you can start rowing all crew away from the boy and then do the last little bit on the steering. It'll make the boat a little unstable, but it'll get you away from the hazard of the boy marker. And particularly if there are other boats like approaching fast behind you, or you wanna catch a boat in front of you, it can scare them quite a lot by the speed with which you come away. <laughs> but do, do know your equipment well before deciding that that's the way you wanna do it. Yeah, at the Green Mountain Head, it's, um only singles, only singles and doubles. But this turn, this this would fit into one of Troy Howell's of comfort in the boat exercises, I think. Um, here's another question, Rebecca. Okay, this is from Diane Davis, who is a master sculler out on the West Coast in California, very uh, accomplished sculler. And she says, could you just mention using a mirror any helpful hints about starting or focusing on turning, for example, 
what's the best way to turn the boat in the, on the head race, a turn such as um, the going around the Cambridge turn to the Elliott Bridge in the head of the Charles? Ha, huh. well. Mirror. You have, you have <laughs> my specialist topic, Diane. Um, so firstly, with regard to mirrors, mirror use is really individual. I have a mirror which I bought off of Coxmate, which is quite a large diameter mirror and it fits to your cap. And I quite like it on rivers where I know the river well. I don't like using a mirror where I don't know the course well because there may be obstructions which are kind of not in your field of vision. Um, the thing I like about the Coxmate mirror is it has a wire attachment, so you can like you're you're supposed to bend the wire to make it the angle and height that suits you. And so I would say practice with the mirror and do it on where you normally row, where you know where the obstacles are, and then you can notice whether or not that extremely large boy or the the overhanging tree or the moored boat or whatever, where, when it shows up for you and how you feel about it. What I would say is there's also a really great system called Hindsight Vision, which is H-Y-N-D, Sight Vision, which is sold by a company out of mm, somewhere in New England. And they have a rear view camera, which is mounted on the bow of your boat, and then it feeds through to a screen, which is in front of you. And they have quite a wide angle camera so that you can actually steer without looking around and melissa who's the woman who owns the company um she swears she can do the head of the charles without turning around well do you know what happened this year yes and, and by the way the hindsight is it is legal to use in the head of the charles and just to um build on rebecca's answer about using a mirror um i personally did not learn to row with a mirror so it's very difficult for me to row with a mirror and i'm just um I'm in that category of people that the light, the flicker of the light and the movement of the water in the mirror really disturbs me when I'm rowing. So I don't row with a mirror. However, um, I had, for some reason this year at the head of the Charles, the, the people who rowed in the um, first races, these are the older the vet veterans and, and senior veterans classes that, that went off first at the head of the Charles, there was a, an enormous amount of glare of the sun this year. And um, numerous racers mentioned it to me because it, it affected, one, their ability to see their hindsight screen. It affected their ability to see their speed coach screen, or I should say uh -huh. that they, they couldn't see it because the glare was very strong. Wow. And also remember race day, there's a lot of things going on. And if you're a little bit nervous, um, two athletes wrote to me that they had bumped their mirror when they were getting in their boat or in the process of their warm up or something, and they didn't get it back to the proper adjustment before they had to start the race. And so that was a factor in their race at the head of the Charles because they needed to be able to see the buoys going around the Cambridge turn. And that, you know, for, for some very close margins, things like that, you know, you've got to be very careful about little details like that. You bump your mirror and then you realize, oh, it's at a little bit of a wrong angle, but you've got to start your race. You can't stop to fix it then. So things to be cautious with, with your um, accessories, I think. Absolutely. But that brings me back to my answer to Diane, which is my preference is to look around for steering. Bear in mind that if you look over your left shoulder and your right shoulder, the view is somewhat different because of parallel parallax. And so let's talk first about turning your boat on what she calls a head race turn like Magazine Beach. So this is a gradual, long turn. And my preference for steering things like this is to do a tiny incremental change. So if you're in a boat with a rudder, you would be doing this by having a very, very small cant on the, um, on the rudder and taking it over many, many strokes. So this requires you to be a skillful enough crew to hold the boat level while it's turning. 
the second, particularly in a river where there is stream as well, although at the head of the Charles there isn't so much stream, but if you're racing on the Tideway in London, for example, where you're racing with the stream, one of the things about steering, some people prefer to go in a straight line and then do an aggressive steer. So you have straight line, turn, straight line, turn. One of the challenges with that is it risks taking you out of the stream. And once you're out of the stream on the tideway, you lose a lot of time very fast. So being able to turn gradually and still hold the boat level is a real skill. For that, use pressure on your thumbs because the boat will tilt over, but it may only tilt a very, very small amount. And if you are turning toward the bow side to the starboard, a little pressure on your left thumb or a little pressure on your right thumb just to press against the turn so that you press on the opposite side to where you're turning can be just enough in a quad or a four to hold the boat level. So just pushing out a little bit of pressure against the gate. Yeah, Diane is primarily a single scholar. Okay, well, that's, that's all good to know. Now, coming through to the Elliott Bridge turn. Now, this is a very tight turn and it is further complicated by the fact that there's a line of boys down the middle of the river and you get penalized if your hull goes over the line of boys, but you are allowed to have your oars going over the line of boys. When I first heard of this, I was like, yay, this is a sort of complex problem I absolutely love. So firstly, understand that it is not a constant arc of a circle. It starts shallowly, going in one direction it then it's like an, a gen, an s it has a very gentle turn in one direction then it turns the other way and then it turns quite sharply and then you have to straighten up to go through a bridge so it's a reasonably complex maneuver my preference is to have in in this race the boys are on your right hand side and so my preference is to look over my shoulder every second or third stroke and I am looking at my bow ball and I'm looking at the direction of travel of the bow ball relative to the next three boys, the ones that we haven't got to yet, so that I can judge whether or not I need to take a tiny turn to the left or the right. And I do that exclusively by working harder at the catch. So I will reach my arm out just a little more than the other side and try and put that blade in the water a little bit earlier in order to bring the bows around. So the challenge here in a single, it's just you. So you have to keep your rhythm while you're doing this because that little extension and pushing a little extra hard on one side can really, really disrupt your rhythm. So listen back to last month's podcast where we talked about how to do rhythm. If you're in a double, which I was the last time I did it, the job of the stroke person who's not steering is to maintain a really strong rhythm. So even though you're like looking around, you can still feel their rhythm of the stroke and stay in time. Because I know I personally have a bad habit of rushing up the slide when I have looked over my shoulder. Because I think, oh, I looked over my shoulder, maybe I'll be late at the catch. And I'm, I'm never late at the catch, but I have to really restrain myself and hold back. So looking really regular you can look every stroke if you need to and in my experience most people have poor steering in a head race because they don't look around frequently enough my friend zoe used to park herself in trees very regularly and mostly it's because she thought she knew where she was and where she thought she was was not where she actually was so there you go a long answer to a short question Let's move on. Our next question is from Graham Spittle. He says, hi, Marlene. I've been watching one of Cameron Buck Buchanan's Yam Squad YouTube videos showing his Leander Coxless 4 having a pre-warm-up warm-up. This is a bunch of aspiring GB Olympic oarsmen and therefore went on to win in the recent Reading Head. He says, being a 71-year-old heavyweight, do I, I do like, I do need a good warm-up, but do I need a pre-warm-up warm-up? And he explains that in early December, he's racing in the British Indoor Rowing Championships uh, at the Olympic Velodrome. And his 2K race will be early, about 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. And his 1K race will be two to three hours later. He says, do you think getting up at five or six o'clock in the morning to have a first warm up and then do a second one at the venue at about eight o'clock makes sense? Or do you think that's too much investment out of my aging bank? 
Great question. Well, first I would say for Graham, if you are fit enough to do two races like that in one day, a 2K race, which you're aiming for sub seven minutes, which is pretty fantastic, and a 1K race, two to three hours, I definitely think that you are fit enough to get up at five or six o'clock in the morning and, and do a small warm up. Um, it's certainly not going to tire you out because you're in, in quite good shape. And it, it would give you a give your body good activation. I mean, the purpose of the warm up, I think, in the morning, particularly if that's when you're accustomed to training, is to get up to help your body wake up, get your muscles moving, get some blood flow uh, going, think a little bit about your technique. But but as we talk about, it, it's just it's for for activation. It's not necessarily to do really hard work at that point. But um, your body's used to moving. And if you particularly know that you like a lot of warm up, um, I think that would probably be very beneficial for you, especially psychologically to, to do that as well. And, uh, and Rebecca, you, you had some uh, good insights when we were talking about the fact that Graham is going to do two races. So what do we think is going to happen here? Well, I think he's going to do better in his second race than his first race, because by that time he'll have done three warm-ups, if you count the first race as a warm-up. I often find that crews tell me that their first race at a regatta was hideous and that they helped felt super over lactated and their legs hurt like fury. And I take that all as a sign that you haven't warmed up. And so I think that a more warm up than you think you need and actually at a much higher intensity for longer than you think you need. And there's a very good podcast episode, which I will reference, um, which was by a woman who is a physiologist and she talks about doing sub race pace, but for nearly as long as the race itself for a 1K or a 2K piece around 20 minutes before the actual race. So you could be actually on the water. And I was intrigued by this, but her, her recommendation was based on physiology. And certainly I think that it's, if you are fit, you are not going to exhaust yourself. It's not an Olympic final for us. <laughs> Therefore, I think we can take more risks. I think a lot of people are mentally too conservative when approaching racing. And if you think about it, you know, what's the worst that will happen? The worst that will happen is that Michael may underperform in his second race. But given that the second race is 1K and his first race is 2K, I think it's far more likely that he will have a good 1K race. I, I agree, Rebecca. I think that oftentimes on race day, people have not really dialed in their warm up enough. And this is, this is something that you need to work out in practice. You need to work it out during the season so that, that you understand your, your own physiology. Some people don't need a lot of warm up. Um, I personally, needed quite a bit of warm up my university crew uh, absolutely hated me for this because i needed i needed 45 to 50 minutes to warm up before a race and uh, we would go out and we would take that long to warm up but um, it's very individual but it's it's very easy to under warm up and then the first part of your race is part is part of your warm up so you do want to experiment with that and um, see what works for you. And I, I would even suggest that Graham have, since he's got some time before the race in December, um, pick one or two days where, where you actually do a practice race day mm -hmm. and, um, you know, get up at five or six and do one warm up, and then go through your pre-race plan and do your warm up, And may, you know, maybe you, you row a trial that isn't totally all out, or maybe you decide, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to replicate race day. I, I always think it's very important to replicate race conditions. And if you were going to do a back-to-back -back race, you know, go yeah. run through this one day. And as well as like for masters nationals in the, in the U S um, I, I encourage people at the big, to kick off a taper, going back to our taper 
It's mm. very good to replicate your race conditions. That means on Saturday and Sunday, if you're going to row one race at nine o'clock and one race at 12 o'clock and another morning at nine o'clock and another morning at 12 o'clock, if you can organize your schedule, now many masters don't always have the ability to do that, but I would strongly suggest to kick off your taper two weeks before your race with a weekend of back-to-back, -back, like back-to-back -back pieces, because you're going to row back-to-back -back races in your competition. So, um, so practice, yeah. yeah. And and definitely. Tom, definitely taper. Not oh, Tom, <laughs> Graham, taper, taper. Make sure you taper yeah. <laughs> for sure. The podcast I was uh, remembering is by Caroline McManus. And it's on the rowers website, R-O-W-E dot R-S. And it's called uh, Best Ways to Prepare for Racing. So um, and it's bear in mind, she works with non-masters athletes, but I think the principles are still very strong. And I will put that link in the show notes. <clears throat> right. Let's move on. We have another question from Ruth Berenson. And this one I'm going to ask Marlene to answer. I was racing at the head of the Charles this year, and because of past problems, I became nervous as another boat came up near to me on the Cambridge turn and took it too wide. The question really is how to disentangle from another boat, pull yourself back to focus and take off. And it's the disentangle, she says, that I've had trouble with in the past. It's a lot easier to get entangled. So, Marlene, what's your advice for Ruth? Oh, Ruth. Oh, gosh. Well, we, we understand how you feel, first of all. Um, try not to get tangled up. That's what I would say first. You know, if you see someone coming at you, you know, try to try to get out of their way or or keep going fast enough so that they can't catch up with you. Um, that is something that does happen sometimes in head racing is someone is coming up on you and you're you're not confident that you can stay ahead of them when actually maybe if you were a little bit more aggressive about your racing you might be able to actually stay ahead of that person without um allowing them to pass you but that that's kind of that depends on your particular situation so if you're now in a situation um that you just collided and you're tangled up um the first thing i i would say is communicate with that other person so that you can separate it from yourself as quickly as possible. Um, and you're, you're probably oftentimes people uh, exchange sharp words when this happens, but I think your ability to just be sober and, and say, okay, tell that person to push off, or I'm going to put my oar over your bow or whatever you need to communicate, like just try to, to communicate with each other because they're experiencing the same thing you're experiencing. Um, and how to pull yourself back to focus and take off. I strongly um, suggest practicing something like this at home. Um, you've got lots of people at your club at Narragansett Boat Club who race in the head of the Charles. Maybe you pick a partner and one day you guys practice getting tangled <laughs> and untangled. Um, you're all, she comes from a club that's got a lot of really top head of the Charles rowers, uh, master scholars there. So um, practice it and how to get yourself back to focus. Have a mantra, have, have a plan. You know, my plan would be practice your flying starts know yeah. that as soon as you're, you know, what do you have to do to get your boat back up to boat speed and take off again? You know, maybe it's probably a flying start or 10 half slide strokes. Um, but, uh, you know, prepare for it. What if, what if scenario? Um, and, uh, you know, just be, just know what you're going to do in case that happens, but do everything that you can to avoid it, you know, yeah. avoiding a, a collision, even if sometimes you have to slow down for a couple of strokes, you will lose less time than if you actually get entangled. But, you know, it's ahead of the Charles and anything can happen. <laughs> so I will say the one thing Marlene hasn't mentioned in terms of avoidance is yell. So ahead of time, when you see something's about to happen, whether you are the person who is in front or behind, bring the other crew's attention to what's happening. And I will explain this with um, a reference to my own experience at the head of the Charles. We were coming up to Elliot in a double and the crew behind us was very clearly faster than us. And they came up close behind us and their bowman was yelling at us. 
And my principle in these situations is obviously to try and push off them and stay in front. But it was reasonably clear they'd been gaining on us for a while. They were faster than us. And I held my course. I wanted them to go wide. And I held my course and we pushed away from them. And what happened was that I'm trying to guess, but it's a good quarter of a mile, I think, that that bend lasts. They were hollering at us and we were just attacking the corner and rowing as tight a line as we could. And they went way off to our left hand side. So they were like, oh, boat width away from us. And then they corrected and came back towards us, by which time we gotten about another three lengths in front of them. And then they gained on us again and they yelled again. And they were wasting so much energy on yelling at us. And we were just using them as a focus point to push on that they didn't overtake us until after we were past the bridge beyond Cambridge Rowing Club. So yeah, yell is a really good. Yes, that's good. Strategy. Right, Communication in, in whatever mm -hmm. tone, communication mm -hmm. um, to avoid as much as you can. But also, you know, there are moments when you like, like Rebecca said, she, you were pushing off them and you can use that as motivation that, you know what, if this looks not absolutely clear that these people are going to pass me or this boat is going to pass me, maybe you can hold them off. You know, you might, this is where you have to kick into maybe um, getting some extra energy in there from your taper, right? So that's one of the reasons you need to taper. <laughs> Absolutely. I always try and stay straight. If I see a tangles coming up, I try and make the other boat take the avoiding action, even if they're the ones overtaking us, which I know race rules say that you have to yield. Um, that's what they were yelling at us. Yield, yield. Yield means nothing to an English person. It's not a word that we use. And we're like, what's she talking about? Never mind. Keep racing. Um, and so I always try and stay straight. And then if I do get an overlap and in a tangle, I will often tell the person what I am going to do. I am going to push off your bow. And then I square up my blade, you know, vertically and try and push away from their bow, which might put them off course. But I'm very aggressive, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm not nice when I'm racing. Oh, um, we can't imagine. <laughs> it's not about me. <laughs> it's not about me. Yield isn't in our vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> that should be a t-shirt, we'll, we'll do a t-shirt. It should, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll be, a, that'll be our new t-shirt. That'll be our motto. Yield is not an option. <laughs> so. Now we have our last question, which is from Michael Knowles, who is the founder of the Bermuda Rowing Association in the Caribbean. And he has said... Hey, Marlene, we love everything you do for rowing. When athletes want a seat pad, what adjustment should you make to the gate height? He said, I presume that it's enough to make your forearms level with the water when sitting at the release with the blades buried. Well, I think that whether you are sitting on a seat pad or whether you are sitting on the seat, you, you would adjust your height the same way. And um, the... The rule that I use is um, that you, the handle is set at your center of gravity. So if you were going, if you were going to do a tug of war, and and you were leaning your body weight and you were going to pull the rope towards your body, that's exactly where your center of gravity is. And if you set your or hand your or lock height so that your handles are at that height, you will be able to keep your forearms level with the water, as Michael rights when sitting at the release with the blades buried. Essentially, your height is correct if you can keep, the, if the height of the elbows and your forearm is above the handle, that's where you want your height to be set. If your elbows and wrists are dropping underneath mm. the handle, then you're, you're set too high. So if your athlete needs a seat pad and they may for, for, um, flexibility issues. If they need to get a little bit, a little bit more compression, they may need a seat pad to create a more height difference between the heels and the seat, and that's fine. But then, you know, if they need to, you you may need to raise the orlocks up one washer so that they're still coming into their body at the at the same level. So, great answer. And I will add that one of the really good things that a club can do for this is to have these snap washers, which are three quarter washers that go around the pin, which you can pull out and adjust without having to use a spanner or a wrench to take the rigor off. 
Yeah, something that's easy that you can quickly quickly adjust it. And, yeah. Uh, my crew is preparing right now for a long distance race called the Waikato 100. It's 100 kilometers long and it's done in four 25K stages. And what we've got is we've entered one boat, but we have four crews rowing. So every 20, 25K, one crew will come off the water and we'll switch out with another crew. And uh, despite our best endeavors, we haven't managed to get everybody the same height, the same weight. So what we're doing is we have these snap washers and individuals have their own seat pads. So we're leaving the oars the same, but some have to adjust their foot stretcher as well. And so all of these things have been brought into consideration by Gordon, who is the man who's, who's coordinating us. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. I hope so. Yeah, we, we have a big barbecue at the end and live music, and it's it's a it's a, a fun race. It's a very big, fast flowing river, um, lots of bridges. And Ali told me this morning that Google Street View, I didn't know this, has rivers navigated filmed from the water. Oh, so you can go great. and see what it's like on the underneath of the bridge, which makes me want to go look at at the rest of the course. Interesting. Well, row for food, right? That's always good. Food and beer. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's another T-shirt slogan. We definitely need some more T-shirts. I know, no, we have to write these things down. Otherwise, we'll forget them. But uh, but I'd like to thank everybody for sending in questions. Um, we just touched on some of the questions that were sent in to us. We have a whole pile of training questions that um, our listeners have sent in and trust us. We will get to those. We'll probably we'll have you know put them into another podcast, and um, we'll let you know when we're going to do that. But we really appreciate people taking the time, and it shows us that there's lots of interest out there to improve as masters. Definitely, and I love problem solving. So having these great questions come in is really, really super. So I think that wraps up our podcast for this month. Have a fabulous November, everybody, and um, tell your friends. We really genuinely welcome new subscribers. We want more people on the mailing list to be part of the community. Please discuss this on the um, Facebook page that we have for Rowing Chat, and we also have a Faster Masters Facebook page, and, of course, there's always the Masters Rowing International group. I will say if you join the group, you don't automatically instantly get entry to that group. It is uh, approved by an administrator. So there may be um, a short delay uh, while we approve you because not all administrators, mostly me, go in there every day. So that was Rowing Chat from uh, the Faster Masters Rowing Radio for November. Till next time. Bye, everyone. <laughs>